Hey everyone, Carl Kapinski is back with a demo from Imagination. Here we go. People always seem drawn to my line work, so it's quite nice to have an outlet for it with you know Instagram. I'll tell you what I've found as well with paintings is they're weird because they're sort of a there's a definite pattern. They're like a journey every time, you know, and they're always the same. You start out with like great ideas and great intentions and great aspirations that you, this is going to be the one. This is a defining painting. And so the first stage is really exciting and you're sketching ideas and, and then you get approval and you start splashing paint on and it's all really good. Then it slowly just morphs into this, ah, oh, this isn't quite as going as well as I wanted it to. And, oh, and so you, by the end, you're like, oh, I just want to get this thing finished. You know, it's like going for a shit. Just like, <laughs> Come on, just, let's get this over and done with. And then at the end, I'm always disappointed by the, the end result. I'm like, oh, that wasn't how I wanted it to be. But the nice thing with it is that like if maybe in six months later, you look back at it and you go, oh, actually, you know, quite like that. Or there's some element there that you, because you were so obsessed with the initial idea or, or maybe something in the process. Because often if you're painting, those initial marks are really exciting and energetic. And then as you render it, they, you, they get lost and you start to think, ah, oh, lost that freshness, you know. But then, you know, six months later, when you forgot about that stage of it, you actually go, right, it turned out okay, that one. I'm trying to find my style or my way I think because I'm not very confident, I copy other people too much, or I'm not copy, but try and emulate what they do. And uh, it's a good thing to do, especially if you're you know, doing it from the really good guys, but you've got to sort of do it and then recognize that three or four years later, it will be morphed into your version of it. I've been using those Pentel brush pens a lot. And it first three years was just, I can't do this, this is so hard to use. But then I slowly started to get to grips with the, how you have to be gentle with it. And, and now I'm, I feel like I'm just starting to do my version of brush pen stuff. But then with the sketches, it's nice because it, really they're quite, they're not throwaway, but you know, you don't have to sort of agonize over stuff too much. I'm not doing preparatory sketches and reference checking out lighting and things like that. I'm just trying to get an idea down pretty quickly. Like a lot of the times when I'm sketching like a figure like this, it's, I'll just make really loose lines that, you know, initial drawing isn't always this detailed before I do ink. I often just do like a series of shapes and, and then I can start to look for what's going on here and is this some kind of backpack he's got on. And I quite like that process where you just kind of playing with the lines a bit more. It really helps me to keep pushing the design aspect as well. And I think everybody's guilty of it and does it. They find a way to do Mecca or find a way to do a historically based character or a fancy character. And then they sort of just do little iterations. And, and I'm st I still do it. I still make the same you know, repetitions and the same uh, design choices. But just by doing these sort of initial kind of loose lines, I can often come up with something that's maybe uh, changes the silhouette a little bit or, or, or can inform the, 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 the structure of if he's wearing armour or, you know, whatever it may be. So I quite like that idea just to change it up a bit and keep things fresh. And it's essentially just gestural marks, you know, but if you can get them to have a, some relevance to a figure, like that's one pose I always do. <laughs> I've done that eight, in so many times, so, but I'll carry on anyway and do it again. And then, you know, so I've got a basis there for the legs and have an idea of the arm. I don't quite know who or what he's doing at the moment, but I can then start to make these sort of gestural lines and try and look for some, you know, interesting shapes in there. And then when I come in with ink, it's, it's a little, little of something to build on, really. I'm pretty bad with narrative stuff. I, and it, that's one thing I'm trying to, really trying to work on a bit, actually, building a bit more of a story and, and trying to do more, 
multiple figures or, or figures that are interacting with each other rather than just standing alone looking cool you know uh, which you know it's, it's nice and there's a place for them and they're great for you know industry work character design all that kind of stuff it's perfect but for this sort of thing sometimes it's nice to to get some kind of interaction and counterplay going on so i'm trying to do a bit more of that but as i'm saying that i'm still doing a single figure sort of looking cool but yeah narrative is definitely something i want to get in a bit more i'm very lucky because my whole family is very artistic so i've got my dad's a musician and he used to draw um, pictures of american indians that he used to give as presents all based on those um was it curtis the photographer who did the american indians i think it was when he used to copy these things and do really beautiful pencil drawings and then my mum's was knitwear design my sister's a musician my dad's a musician my brother's an artist and a musician we didn't have a lot of money growing up, but there was always people making things or making music or doing something, you know. So that was a, a great environment to, to sort of be raised in. But as far as artists go, there's one or two who I've worked with that have been really influential and, and maybe not even influential, but inspiring to be around and sort of to feed off. So like there's a guy called Paul Dainton who still works at Games Workshop who was just a really, really good artist. He did the things that I don't do so well, really well. He's a great storyteller in his pictures and he can build a fantastic epic narrative and stuff. So he was a big influence and I uh, worked with Adrian Smith who was another artist there who was a really amazing at designing on the fly and and also incredible rendering technique sort of ability to light stuff without reference so they were a big influence sort of when i first started out at games workshop really it's a huge list of masters that i've tried to emulate russian painters like Ilya repin kramskoy the portraitist and shishkin there's a Polish guy called Josef Brandt, who was a sort of military painter. Some French military painters from the late 1800s, Maisonnier and Detail, who really in inspired me. John Singer Sargent, obviously. And then his, the guy who kind of took over was Philip de Laszlo, another amazing portraitist. Uh, Velazquez, Soroya. Um, there's just too many. Arthur Rackham, when I was a kid, I loved his books as growing up. My mum had some of his fairy tale books that he'd illustrated, and uh, Heinrich Clay. Um, and then Norman Rockwell was a huge, huge, blew me away when I came across his work. And Wyeth, Howard Pyle. I mean, it's just the list. I could go on and on the whole video could be two hours of me just listing artists that I love so there's so many of those guys that I wasn't really taught about them at art college because as I said uh, in the interview you know it's my art course was a bit of a disappointment a lot of a disappointment to me nobody was teaching me these anything about these guys that were obviously had some relevance to what I wanted to do and what I wanted to explore there's no tutors there who told me about so I had to kind of dig it out on my own and, and you know do my own research and, and then modern day I really like Phil Hale's work and Kent Williams and Bill Shinkovich who was a comic artist that I really liked and Dave McKean all from the sort of late 80s period Really liked Mobius as well when I was uh, quite young and I think I, I really liked him without realising just quite who he was or what. I just remember seeing these images that I absolutely loved and, you know, thought, oh, that's so cool. So did you grow up reading a lot of comics? Or? Not really. I didn't have a lot of disposable income and maybe the comic market was a lot more not underground. It's not like in the US like where comic shops were a big, big thing. It was only maybe I'm from a pretty small city in in England, Nottingham. So it was only maybe one comic shop when I was a kid. So it was often things that my dad brought back from me because he, he, he was a musician. He'd go off to 
to France or something, gig in and come back with a, some weird little book that he'd found out there. I liked Spider-Man when I was a kid, I really liked Spidey. <laughs> I used to draw him all the time. I also try to spend less time on the faces now because for a long time I just used to work on the face because probably the thing I can do most quickly or naturally and easily and now I'll try and spend more time on the rest of the figure and just put the face in quite quick. Yeah, so if you were dissatisfied with your like art schooling, how did you like learn of all the other artists and like practice your skills? And... It was just a long, laborious and I mean I'm still doing it. It's frustrating really because I think, you know, bearing in mind that I'm 48 so we didn't have the internet as young kids so you'd have to go to the library and find a book about someone you wanted to learn about and and then it wasn't so instantaneous either so you didn't just kind of like now you go oh that's cool oh that's cool right. then you went and you took the book out for two weeks and you took it home and then you looked at it and really tried to absorb it part of me wishes we'd had the opportunities that are available now with like like the online courses that you guys do you know, I think I could have learned so much more efficiently and quickly, you know, rather than this process that I, I've been through, which has been, you know, long, <laughs> kind of making mistakes and, okay, that's not right, I'll go back and try and relearn that. Really, it's been a matter of self-teaching, going to life classes, studying masters whose work you really enjoy and maybe even making small master copies and things like that. But with hindsight, if I'd had the opportunity when I was at art college, because we had life classes, but no one taught life class. It was just there, uh, something you went along to, and you did it if you wanted to. Now, I think, you know, to, to do these online courses as a sort of support in support of what you want to do, you know, however you want to take your career, what, whatever direction, would have been, you know, absolutely invaluable to me. And also someone to teach you these kind of fundamentals that maybe when I was at art college, they kind of fell out of fashion or they had yeah. been lost. You had to dig around to find the right college, the one that was still had a realist painting mm -hmm. background or wanted to talk about anatomy and yeah. structure and perspective and all these kind of things. So, um, yeah, it's... It's a bit of a regret, really, of mine that maybe the the system let me down somewhat, but I don't know, I've got there in the end. <laughs> I don't know why I've given him a big sticking plaster on his neck there, but uh, I might make him like a modern-day vampire hunter or something. <laughs> but yeah, I think also one thing that I would say is it. Art schools are fine. I don't know if it's the same in the US, but in the UK they do tend to have a, an in-house style, as it were. And so everybody's taught to draw a certain way or paint a certain way. And you can start to look generic and it, it's quite hard to stand out from the crowd. So, so maybe the fact I'm self-taught, uh, learning those fundamentals, like you know, when I've watched the Proco things, you, you've been taught pretty ac academic stuff, really. Yeah. And um, that's the stuff that I was never taught. And I've had to try and go back and relearn in my own way. I think that's probably the, one of the big mistakes I made was not to, you know, not to be taught the stuff that I've had to relearn uh, in my own sort of time. Like human anatomy is, I don't know, I have a, encyclopedic knowledge but I, I've got enough to because when you're sketching as well a lot of it's about getting the idea across so you I don't need to perfectly render everything out and as long as it looks like what it's meant to look like and it reads to the viewer that's where I'm trying to get with the ink work at the moment I still think I'm a, a tendency to overwork stuff as it were I want to sort of get to the point where I'm just doing enough I think that's when you're getting like Yoda level <laughs> it's when you just do enough and then you go that's it that's enough that's all you're getting you can see what's going on there and I don't need to tell you any more than that that's like that's the real deal for me and I, I hope that when I'm 80 I'm looking back at this stuff and going that was crap <laughs> that really was not very good 
you know, because you've reached the level where you're like, yeah, I was okay then, but I'm a lot better now. You know, to draw without reference is a, is a hard skill and, you know, it takes a long time to get good at. So don't get frustrated that you, you can't get the results. There's sort of that idea that artists are a tortured soul. It's, there's, there's a reason that's the stereotype, because if you're not accepting of it, you are a tortured soul. Because for me, you're going to die never doing the painting you wanted to do. And you can accept that idea and sort of welcome it into your mindset. Then I think you can be a much better artist, a much happier person as well. Especially, you know, if you're studying, to study and then alongside that, just have a bit of fun and play. And, because you can take the ideas you've learned maybe in, in your online course or whatever it is you, you, you're looking at and take those and then try and play with them. But if it goes wrong, it's no big deal. Nobody's going to fire you or you know what I mean you just just try and apply the things you're learning and, and see if you can do something with it and eventually it'll, it'll start to stick I love sitting and I love I mean that's part of the reason I stopped working digitally as well because as satisfying it as it was I love taking just some ink and some paper and making an artifact it's a craftsman thing you you you, you take two elements put them together and make something that hopefully looks nice and you can do it, you can do it digitally completely. Of no kind of nothing against digital art. It was just personally, it was there was a bit of a bit of a problem to, to actually get what I wanted out and onto the paper as it were. So yeah. I mean you have to understand I'm not as good as the Korean guys are at this stuff. They've really studied it, but, but uh, how you can break it down into composite elements that it's that thing we said in the interview, break it into chunks, it's a lot less daunting and less intimidating. I'm bearing in mind those basic forms when I'm putting the lines down. I'm just always trying to consider where my perspective point, what the angle of the, whether it's the arm or the leg is at, and how that's existing in the 3D environment. And that's a pretty traditional technique, isn't it? A teaching method is to use your your line or your the shape of your mark making to follow the form it makes that idea a lot more easy to tackle without using reference i think how many books do you have oh well, i've self-published four oh, really? yeah so it's not like i've got a publisher so I've, I've got to financially pay for the initial print run yeah. and so it's quite a big process for me so what i tend to do is Every year, I'll publish a book of all of the stuff I've done that year. Mm. And then I launch it usually at, at Luca Comics and Games because it just falls at the right time. It's close to Christmas and, you know, so it makes sense to do it then. And, you know, I'll do like 148 pages of black and white and a few mm. colour pieces. So I've got those. But the first two now are, are out of print. And so we collected them together in the big Kapinski yeah. and then did a whole big colour section as well of work I've done for various clients and some personal projects. So that was quite nice to get a proper colour section in there as mm. well. Because that's, that's, you know, that was initially what I was doing more of than the, than yeah. the sketching, as it were. The more, the more of that stuff I do, the less of this stuff I'm doing. With it. The self-published stuff will do a thousand copies and yeah. you, we've reprinted every book. Yeah. So the, even though I've put the two, first two out of, publish, out of print now, they, they, I still managed to sell maybe a couple of thousand of the first two volumes, I'd say, which is, you know, fantastic for, for such a small operation, you know. You've got to be a bit pragmatic, I think, as well. In, in, you've got to understand that it's not just about you, is it? This, you, especially if you've got a, a fan base, they, they want to see what you're doing. I mean, you've got to be respectful to people, haven't you? And, and there's got to be a, an interaction there. It can't just be, well, this is what I do. If you don't like it, screw you. It's like, what kind of person is that, you know? And it still surprises me, the people I've managed to make contact with and have responded, you know, who I really admire. And I, I had messaged Mike Minola this morning, you know, saying, oh, you're going to be at San... And he's like, and he replied. It's not like I, 
I'm a friend, but he's took the time to reply and say, oh yeah, great, have a good time. And sounds intimidating being <laughs> sat next to Jung Gi all day. <laughs> I said, yeah, basically it is. So, you know, that, that kind of things, I think what it's what it's all about. It should, you know, I don't know. We're all slightly awkward and we're all a little bit socially awkward, I think, as it comes with the territory, this, being an artist, being a fan of this kind of thing, 90% of people are a little bit introverted. Yeah. And so, you, you know, if you're an arsehole to them, and you think, I, it's not just like they're, they've come along and they're like, look how good I am. And, you know, they're, they're all a little bit shy. And, and, and I think you should take time for that because, I don't know, we're all just trying to get along in life, aren't we? How often do you paint now? Most weeks I'm painting, you know, I'm working on one or two oil paintings. All the stuff I do for Cool Mini or not is oil painted. Mm. So we just worked on a project that's undisclosed, so I can't <laughs> tell what it is, but it was based on a black and white movie. So that was really cool. I got to do all these characters in black and white. I really enjoyed that. Quite a good way to learn about value as well, working. Mm. I think that's pro possibly one of the good things at Workshop as well. When when I first started out, we did a lot of black and white pieces for the for the rule books. So you spent you know a good maybe sixty to seventy percent of your time working in either black and white acrylic or inks, or really helps you learn about value and how important it is to focus on. The balance between the two as well. I need to give him a weapon there for a vampire hunter. I don't know. I was going to give him a hammer to bang a stake in. Crossbows could be cool. A little handheld crossbow. He's got all the heads of the vampires on on his backpack there. One of the weirdest jobs I got was well, not weird, but oh, it's great fun. Was designing Nerf guns. I still don't know how they came to the decision, oh, we'll get Karl Kopinski to do this. <laughs> but they did, and it was, yeah, it was really cool. I never got any of them, though. So now I've got a son, I really wish I'd gone, yeah, as long as you give me one of every one. Well, they were sort of, again, early iterations of them. So a lot of it was not that I specifically designed the whole gun, but I might have done a load of ideas and then they'd release the gun and you could see, oh, that's, they took that bit and that bit and mashed them together. But I did uh, uh, quite a lot on um, a series of weapons that were like, I think like zombie hunting game or something, that were all kind of mishmash with tape around the handles. Mm -hmm. and so I did quite a lot of work on that. And then they did another series that fired these little foam discs that did a hell of a lot of work on as well. See, this is, I don't do narrative very well, but I, I think I'm maybe quite good at building a narrative into the character as I go along. So as he's developed, you're like, okay, so the sticking plaster there, but he's bleeding. He's a vampire hunter. Has it all gone a bit wrong for him? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's one of the things I try to do with character design, is I try to kind of build a story around their costume detailing maybe a bit and you can sort of you know always have to tell a story in the picture you can tell a story by you know what they're carrying and and the things they have with them especially when you come to design a fantasy character one of the things that interested me was that a lot of the things accoutrements that they'd carry with them were non-replaceable so you were from a different age you know there where if you had an armor it would probably cost you half the cost of your house. You know, you didn't just, you know, wear it and when it was broke, go and get a new bit. All the stuff they had was, you know, looked after and cared for and repaired. And I think you can add a real level of interest to your character design if you can do a bit of that, that kind of stuff in there. And I think also I like the idea of learning about the sort of mechanics of it and how it, it works, not just what it does, you know. I, I like the idea of that with armour and things like this, you know, what's going on underneath the armour and layering detail and stuff like that is good for character design, I think. But it's also, you know, like that's, as I said to you before, that's one of the things I miss about 
being in a studio like when you said, oh, crossbow. That's the kind of thing you do with your friends or the, the colleagues when you're in a studio. Like, oh, I'm gonna do this guy, what can I give him? And it's always nice to have that extra set of eyes or ears. I'm not a good businessman really at all. My wife's really good, but there's only so much she can do. I mean, you know, look at the setup you guys have had to get to really yeah. kick this into proper monetary system. Got to put so much time and energy into it. And I don't want to stop drawing, yeah. you know. There's a balance there. But I think, you know, I could be a bit more savvy about it. Some people kept recommended Patreon, is it? Oh, Patreon, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but again, it's like I have to do video content. And, or even YouTube, they say, I'll set up a YouTube channel. So I set one up and then I post a video maybe once a year. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah, going to work, it's... Carl. <laughs> yeah. The thing for me with Instagram is I'm doing something like this daily, really. Yeah. Then, you know, I can post every day. But still, I should do more videos and, you know, that kind of thing. That's the great thing about the social media, really, is that now, as I said to Stan, you know, it's we. You know, I have clients asking me to do the, the the style that's posted on Instagram, you know, or my style. But before that, I, I always felt like I was I had to do something a bit more polished or finished. Or uh, I, I'm not very confident naturally. I'd always think, well, other artists are doing stuff that's a bit more involved, and maybe I need to do that, you know. I guess the social media side of it has helped me get a bit more confident in my ability and my own angle on it really I suppose. Like I say you know I mean I know what gets clicks I know what gets the most hits but it's great but I don't want to just do that I mean you know I'll do occasionally do a Batman or a Hellboy or Wolverine or this kind of stuff or sexy girl <laughs> you know but I want to keep investigating themes and like I've never done a, I've done a lot of soldiers who look like this, but I've never built it into someone who's doing a, you know, something like a, a vampire hunting theme. So I quite like that. I've done vampire hunters in a fantasy way. So I want to just keep trying stuff out really. And, and people seem to like it anyway. Nobody's like, oh, come on, do Batman. We're bored of this, do Batman again. People are really nice about it, or really <laughs> lucky. Probably nearly finished, really. Probably should leave it. <laughs> Probably in danger of ruining it if I keep going on. There was a great quote I think I read from Gregory Manchester, who said the moment he thinks he might be finished, he puts the painting down. Shall I sign it? Thank you. You guys did a great job. <laughs> yeah. Really. We did this. Yes. <laughs> we did it together, guys. Yeah, I did that guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Thanks again, Carl, for the demo. You can check out more of his stuff at carlkapinski.com. And if you want more of these videos, hit all those buttons that make YouTube happy. We've got tons more videos on the way with new stuff every day. See you tomorrow.